So as Nicole said, my name is Fran Smith. I'm a veterinarian with who's a board specialist. I'm board certified in small animal practice. I'm recently retired. Just so you know, a ferriogenologist is a specialist, much like we have in human medicine. Ferriogenology would be the combination of OBGYN and urology and human medicine. I breed, own, train, handle, and judge retriever breed, Labrador retrievers. I recognize that there are other retrievers and please don't be insulted. This is my attempt at a joke, but the others, other retrievers are all lesser to Labradors. I'm the president of the Labrador Retriever Club Inc, which is the parent club. And I'm the health chairperson for the Labrador Retriever Club, which means I get all the phone calls from people all over the country, which I'm glad to get or happy to help with when people are concerned about an issue with their Labradors. I'm also the president of the Orthopedic Foundation for Animals, which is the Canine Health Information Center. <clears throat> this talk is about responsible dog breeding, utilizing health screening for genetic diseases. And I want you to look at this picture. This is not, in my opinion, the handsomest of dogs, but we call this dog the pariah dog. And it is a picture of what you would see as the street dog in any of the Caribbean nations in Africa, or even in the Southern US, which is where I live right now, where there's a lot of random assortment of dogs. This dog um, is the biologically most fit dog that there is. He is longer on leg than deeper in body, moderate length of coat, erect ears, a longer muzzle, and pretty, pretty rapidly built for speed. The reason for this is this is a dog that can survive hunting on his own. Uh, this particular treat is the dog and the relationship to orthopedic disease was written by a guy who's a very, very famous veterinarian who first was concerned about orthopedic di diseases in purebred dogs and the impact the breeder has on changing dogs and, and making them more uh, prone to orthopedic disease. As an aside, you might be interested in knowing natural selection greatly decreases the risk of hip dysplasia in a wolf pack both because of their social structure, only the alpha pair breed and reproduce. And if you, you don't get to be the alpha pair if you have hip dysplasia because you don't survive long enough to be able to achieve that status. In captive wolf populations, they have hip dysplasia at a greatly increased rate compared to their wild counterparts. Throughout history, man has shaped the, and during domestication, we've changed dogs to do what we want, different size, shape, behavior, and temperament, and realized that the early dogs were not pets. They were guard dogs in that they alerted people to uh, threats, and they also were scavengers. They ate all the garbage. We didn't have waste management coming on Thursdays to pick up our trash. The dog did all of that. But we select for these characteristics that we so love and change. So the dog is the most genetically engineered animal on the planet. Form and function. Nowadays for dogs, we select dogs for particular reasons. <clears throat> um, we have a lot of sheep dogs. We have sled dogs in the Arctic. We have dogs that go to Earth. The German Shepherd is a guard dog. Here in Mississippi, we see a huge number of Great Pyrenees who are used as flock guardians, and they live right with those flocks and instinctively protect them. And then, of course, my love, the Labrador Retriever with a bird. Um, I will tell you also, as a Labrador Retriever owner who formerly raised some sheep and had sheep escape, that Labradors are totally useless as sheep dogs. What they got out with the, the sheep and said, and you want me to do what? And what are these white fuzzy things? Form and function applies to a lot of what we do as humans. We pick what we like. I happen to like red vehicles. I have a red Ford F-350 four-wheel drive pickup. And I also have a red Mini Cooper. Each of those has form and function and each have specific capabilities for tasks that I might have. Likewise, that's how we select our dogs. 
So why do you purposely breed a dog? You get predictability and trait expression. In appearance, if you want a dog that's going to point birds, have a long, silky coat, have a friendly dem demeanor, you're going to want a setter or you're going to want a retriever. Or if you want something that looks like a pug, you're going to pick a pug. Size. Purebred dogs, you can pretty much predict how good they're going to be. <clears throat> I'm always amazed when a client will adopt a dog of a breed like a Mastiff. And then when it's a year old, say to me as a veterinarian, I never would have chosen this dog if I realized how big they were going to get. So here we have the extremes, the Irish Wolfhound and the little Chihuahua cross. If you want the little one, don't buy the big one and vice versa. Temperament. Dogs also have predictable temperament when it comes to Labrador Retrievers. You don't want a Labrador Retriever if you want a guard dog. They will bark. But once, if you're not home and the burglar gets in, the Labrador is likely to say, well, you need to come to this room. This is where they keep the good stuff. They're kind of everybody's social buddies. That being said, it would be really unusual for a Labrador to be aggressive with people. It sh that should never occur under any circumstances. Breeders are the custodians of the of the, the breed and their gene pool. So it's their ethical responsibility of all breeders to use all the available tools to produce healthy dogs. So what's a dog breeder? It depends upon where you live. According to Webster's Dictionary, it's simply someone who breeds dogs. In the state of Minnesota, where I practiced for 50 years almost, the definition was the owner of the mother of a litter at the time when the puppies were born, a pretty complicated definition. But that means it could be as few as one dog or it could be a hundred. And a breeder sometimes has purebred dogs, sometimes mixed bred, sometimes we deliberately breed. HSUS statistics would tell you that a great majority of dogs born in the United States are accidental occurrences. So the accidental ones, these are the loose running dogs that are just reproducing at will. <laughs> Excuse me, we have a lot of casual backyard breeders where they don't necessarily help test, can't have any real criteria. Oftentimes it's two hunting buddies who say, Jay, gee, your dog's a really good upland dog. My dog's great in the water. Let's have a litter of puppies, it'll be fun. We have commercial high volume breeders where their dogs are a business. Um, these people are set up with, in many, many cases, fabulous physical setups. They get lots of training and socialization, feeding, et cetera, et cetera. They do have lots of dogs, but you can do lots of dogs well, or you can do one dog poorly. Um, we also have a lot of purposeful hobby breeders, which I would say I fall into that idea. My passion is the Labrador Retriever and what it can do. And my goal is to produce a beautiful show dog that can also do a fabulous job in the hunting field. That's hard. These hobby breeders who have a passion for breed does not inherently equate to being responsible. There are breeders of these breeds that they are passionate about who do not care about health, who do not care about temperament. So we have many types of breeders. So the decision to breed dogs brings responsibility to each of you. You need proper care, feeding, and housing, proper socialization, screening prospective homes, and a lifelong commitment. My contract, and I, I encourage all of you to have a contract that says, if you buy a puppy from me for whatever reason at any time in its life, I would like the first option to have that dog return to me. I believe as breeders, we've decided that they should be born and we should decide that they are well cared for for their entire home. Screening prospective homes, I do that as well. And I think that's important for you too. Um, today, we have many children who are, we probably always have had, who are poorly behaved. When I interview a family, I give a couple of very gentle uh, um, recommendations and actually requests to children. And if the children will not respond to those requests, I do not sell that family a puppy. 
because if their kids don't behave, I guarantee you their dog won't behave and in the long run, the dog will suffer. So again, to breed or not to breed, remember we have a lot of responsibilities, screening homes, socialization, food, housing, and care. A good diet is hallmark to producing healthy puppies. So what's the most important concern of the public when purchasing a purebred or a hybrid or a designer puppy? And the answer to that is health. I think this is a really cute picture and that's true. There's lots of reasons for that. People have a lot of emotion attached when they get a puppy. For many people, it's their child, it's part of their family. And so they want that dog to be in blooming good health for all of its life. Additionally, the cost of veterinary care as veterinary care has become more sophisticated has escalated and rightfully so. Because in veterinary medicine, we do pretty much every procedure that is done in human medicine and we don't have insurance or Medicare or Medicaid to pay for it. So beyond providing puppies with their first shots and warming, you want to do health screening because you don't want to produce puppies that are blind, lame, or seized. And by using careful health screening, <clears throat> you can minimize the inherited diseases. And that defines you as a serious, dedicated, responsible breeder. I also want to point out <clears throat> And you probably all know that she wouldn't be on this show. There's a lot of anti-breeding propaganda today. And I want you to remember this. If we spay and neuter every dog and shut down all dog breeders, where will we get the next generation of pets? And that is true. Think about the last dodo bird. We don't want to be responsible or contribute or allow the animal rights people to tell us we should not responsibly breed our dogs. So selection criteria in breeding should be for confirmation traits, type, which is, does your dog look like a Labrador? Or does it look like a pug? Soundness, can it get from point A to point B? Temperament, pedigrees, working ability, and health. So the Orthopedic Foundation for Animals is a not-for-profit. We're a 5013C. It was established in 1966. It was the result of John Olin, a philanthropist, he owned Winchester Arms, and he was an avid duck hunter. He was concerned about his Labradors who became lame as they age, and he provided all of the seed money for the OFA to begin, and it was began on the campus of the University of Missouri in Columbia, Missouri. Um, interestingly, because we're going to talk about eyes as well, the reason we have an eye program today was through a dedicated poodle breeder whose name was Dolly Krautner, who was concerned about her toy and mini poodles who became blind after the age of five. And so she respond, was responsible for the funding for starting the organization that we now call CARE. So OFA objectives are to collate and disseminate information about orthopedic and genetic disease. When it started, it was orthopedic only. We didn't have genetic tests. Advise, encourage, and establish control programs to lower the incidence of orthopedic disease. Encourage and finance research in orthopedic and genetic disease. Receive funds and make grants to carry out these objectives. Now, I think it's important important for you to know there are very few funding organizations for, I'm going to say dog research. The same is true of cats, but this is a dog talk today. Basically, all funding for small animal research basically comes through the Canine Health Foundation, through the American Kennel Club, and through huge partnerships with Serena, who shares a lot of funds for all of these objectives. Without that, we could not have any um, small animal research for genetic disease. So the OFA, OFA objectives are met through a core of radiologists who are board certified. Whoops, why did that happen? Uh, let me bump it. Sorry. Okay, let me try to go back again. Okay. <clears throat> 
four certified radiologists. We have 22 radiologists who read cases for us on a fee-for-service basis, and they evaluate x-rays for hip dysplasia, elbow dysplasia, leg calf Perthes disease, and shoulder OCD. For those of you who are not familiar with the term, hip dysplasia is a condition of the rear limbs where the hip socket is not properly formed and as a result, the body tries to make more bone to make it fit better, resulting in arthritis. The same thing happens in the elbow <laughs> and leg calf perthes is a disease also of the pelvis, the hip joint, which happens probably due, it's poorly understood, but it has to do with a decreased blood supply to the part, to the head of the ball of the ball and socket joint resulting in arthritis as well. So the OFA databases and website provide tools for breeders to make informed breeding decisions. And we do fund grants. We have funded many million dollars of grants. Recently, the OFA funded a seat at the University of Missouri Columbia to ensure that genetic testing goes on at that facility who has done at that facility has done fantastic genetic testing. We, so it's a voluntary diagnostic service. <clears throat> it's a database for genetic health status of dogs and cats. And it is the world's largest database containing genetic information. Remember, this is voluntary. So do we know everything? No. Do we have all the data? No. But we collate and share the data that you as breeders share with us. And our mission is to improve the health and welfare of companion animals through a reduction in the incidence of genetic disease. So these OFA databases, and we're going to talk about them in more detail, and I have some pictures for you, are all databases that are based on what we call phenotype. And the way I like to explain phenotype, it's what you see. So in the case of a dog, if you look at it, it you know what color it is. If it's if it is black, phenotypically it's black. Genotypically, it might be something different, and we'll talk di uh, differently about that, et cetera. So these are all databases that are based on phenotypes, something that we can see either in just a test panel or in an X-ray or do, doing a specific type of physical examination. There are also DNA databases for genetic diseases. And these tests here are typically for diseases that are inherited in what we call an autosomal recessive manner of expression. So that means in order for a dog to have one of these diseases, it must get one gene for the disease from its mother and one from its father. These are actually the easiest diseases to control, but it's only been with great effort that we've been able to figure out what was the cause and what to do about it. And again, I'm going to use the Labrador a lot because it's my own breed and I guess I'm entitled to give you this information. When it comes to exercise-induced collapse, that is a neuromuscular disease related to a gene called Dynamin 1. Dogs with EIC tend to tremble in the rear end, wobble, collapse, and in a very few rare cases actually die from this neuromuscular disorder. It became prevalent in Labrador Retrievers about 35 years ago. And it was suspected to be related to particular dogs. Through the effort of many Labrador breeders and researchers, ultimately we discovered the gene that was responsible for it. So now we can do gene tests to decrease the incidence of that disease without eliminating huge numbers of dogs from a gene pool. So your OFA website can give you the most complete source of information you can find anywhere. What I'll tell you about, again, OFA testing is, if you as a breeder or owner have a test 
done, whatever test that is, and send the results to the OFA. If the results are normal, the OFA will post that information on your dog, not on you, your information is private, to the website. So if you, and those of you who are listening, if you want to look information up on Labradors and you want to know something about Danik, that's my kennel name, D-A-N-I-K-K, -K, you can go to the OFA website, click on advanced search, click Danik, and they will show you all the dogs of mine that have had health clearances. So that tool is available to anyone who has the registered name or number of a dog, and you don't have to be even a registered dog if your name is in the database. Helps a lot with breeding decisions. If the information is not there, it means that maybe the animal was never tested or alternatively it, results could have been abnormal and then the owner or that information is not posted unless the owner specifically requests it. So this is my pug, and they certainly have their set of issues. Oh, this dog of mine happened to be very, very healthy. He had a long tongue. He did not have any respiratory issues, and he lived to be 13. He did have patellar luxation, and we're going to talk about that, and I'll explain why that happens, and had surgery, but was a healthy dog for all of his, all of his years. So what's the way to positively select for genetically healthy offspring? The best way you need healthy parents to have healthy offspring and you need health screening. You cannot prevent all genetic disease. However, we have the knowledge and tools to improve the health of all puppies. Genetic disease, in fact, accounts for 25% of all canine disease process. And it occurs as frequently in designer dogs, crossbred dogs, and purebred dogs. There are no breeds of dog that are genetically perfect, nor is any, there any mammal. We all have genes that are not desirable. So to manage these diseases, there's a lot of factors. First of all, you need to know how it's inherited. As I said, recessively inherited diseases are the easiest to control. Are there tests for that disease, both genotypic, which is what the gene makeup is, and phenotypic, which is what they look at. The prevalence of the defective gene, how severe it is, and the breed pool size and diversity. All of these things are modified by knowing what breed you're dealing with and knowing how serious the disease is. And I'm gonna give you another example. There is a syndrome in Labradors, um, which results in a scaling around the nose. It's cosmetic, it's not particularly severe, and it's not really a real big issue. But there is a genetic test available for it, and it is a recessive. I would never discard a dog from my breeding program if it carried a gene for this particular trait, because the disease is, in itself is not severe at all. And even the American College of Veterinary Dermatology does not consider it a big deal. So you have to look at what you're testing for and the effect of what that disease does to the dog. Is there always a screening test? No, there's no test for bloat. There's no test for epilepsy. And sometimes there are complications from late onset diseases. I do think we need to be realistic when we do health testing in that if you are talking about a disease that occurs in a 12 or 13 year old dog, or even a 10 or 11 year old dog, those are elderly dogs. And while that's very important to that dog and to a family, I do not believe that is a place where we need to put either our efforts or necessarily a lot of dollars in controlling them. So phenotypic tests, we talked about that they identify clinically affected individuals. We want to know if our dog does or does not have hip dysplasia, and we want to use the one that does not have hip dysplasia in our breeding program. 
The underlying genetic causes of these are all unknown, okay? Hip dysplasia, elbow dysplasia, cardiac, et cetera. They're likely based on what we call <clears throat> polygenetic traits, multiple traits um, and multiple genes. Genotypic tests, these are the, the tests where we actually know what gene causes what, and there are a number of them here. Um, a lot of these will not be important to you. Dolly Croner, this is the disease that she was concerned about, a disease called progressive retinal atrophy, is what caused her little poodle to go blind. So now by testing parents, you can even use a dog who is blind in a breeding program, not that I recommend that, and breed it to a dog that is clear genetically and none of the offspring will be blind from CRA. So there are benefits to testing for recessively transmitted traits that allow you to maintain your, breed, your gene pool. That's particularly important when you have gene breeds that have very limited gene pools. And I'll use as an example, the otter hound. Their gene pool is very, very narrow. So they have to always select the best for the best. And some of those dogs are not perfect. So genotypic tests, they test for liability genes. It may be a direct gene mutation or it might be a linkage. A linkage test means it's not the gene itself they found, but they know that that gene is near this group of genes and so they call that a linkage test. It might be breed specific or general and it's dependent upon the mode of inheritance. Some diseases also have variable penetrance and expressivity and there would be an example of the scaling disease that I talked about on the Labrador nose. Some dogs have a couple scales, some have none, some have really scaly nose. It's a tool. This is one of my <clears throat> old, old, old girls and my granddaughter who was my Greek puppy socializer. And this is the kind of temperament I would suspect expect of a Labrador mom of mine, any person should be able to handle those puppies. No other dog's gonna come near them. Now, a German Shepherd's mom, I would not expect the German Shepherd's mom to allow a stranger to come and handle her puppies. That is not appropriate temper, uh, temperament for a shepherd. Again, getting back to legislation, remember, pay attention to legislation in your area. Make sure your legislative representatives understand that dogs are important to us and that good breeders deserve good care and support. All of our initial selection factors in dogs were selected with gene mutations and behavior traits such as fear have higher heritability than traits such as retrieving desire. Now, when we talk about heritability, heritability from most studies or in most descriptions, if you have a heritability of zero, it means whatever happened to your animal has nothing to do with its genetic makeup. And if you have a heritability of one, it means it's entirely due to genetics. Most diseases are somewhere along that spectrum. And diseases that have a heritability of over about 0.3 are able to be controlled and improved by selection. So again, purebred dogs have predictable physical traits. They have fairly consistent behavior and temperament. Hopefully they're all health screened. And just so you know, crossbred dogs do have 215 known genetic disease predispositions reported in the literature. Pursuit of the best, you should be motivated by passion for your dog, art and science, and typically involves financial loss versus gain. My best year in Labradors, when I was showing and competing more majorly, I only lost $25,000. Um, I'm not suggesting you should lose money, but there's nothing inherently wrong with making money on dogs, provided you are doing it in a responsible, socialized way. And your gain as a breeder is the progress you make towards making a perfect dog. 
you as the breeder are responsible for selection choices on the dog as a dog. So let's talk a little bit about ears. The reason dogs now, many of our breeds have ears that droop or hang down is because all baby puppies, all canid puppies have ears that lay down and that makes them more puppy-like, which gives them to John Q. Public more appear, more appeal. Warm brown eye color tends to connote friendly demeanor. So we select for things that help make our dogs marketable. What's more marketable today than a French bulldog and as cute as they are? So let's talk about chick and using these tests. The Canine Health Information Center involves sharing the results of your health test, whether the tests are normal or not normal. It was conceptualized by the AKC Delegates Parent Club and the Canine Health Committees. It was implemented in the fall of 2001 with eight pilot breeds. And the Labrador Retriever Club was breed number one. We, for more than 20 years, were also the most popular breed. Today, we have 200 breeds participating and 180,000 dogs have been issued chip numbers. And this is the mission, and this is important to all of you, a source of health information for owners, breeders, and scientists that will assist in breeding healthier dogs. Parent clubs in each breed identify specific health issues that they're concerned with. And those are the tests that go into what are the chick requirements. For the Labrador Retriever breed, the requirements are OFA hip x-rays, OFA elbow x-rays, hair eye clearances, <clears throat> um, the EIC test for exercise-induced collapse, and the test for dilute color. Each parent club must contain at least three health conditions of concern. A dog can get a chick number if it's permanently identified by a tattoo or microchip and the owner agrees to share the result of the parent club recommended test regardless of the outcome. So you can look at pedigrees of the proposed breeding for health strengths and weaknesses, as well as the traditional analysis of confirmation, type and performance, strengths and weaknesses. <clears throat> In short, check health test makes the results variable, available in an online publicly accessible database and recognize the dogs that have been tested and the owners share it. Chick is about encouraging health testing and awareness, and the chick numbers are issued when the test results are entered into the database, satisfying the breed requirement, and when the owner has opted to share the results. So again, chick is not about normalcy. It's not a stamp of approval for breeder and an award program. It's a tool for you to use in selecting better breeding dogs. So I'm going to use some pictures here. This happens to be a beagle that is owned by Eddie Zook, who is the chief executive officer at OFA. And this is a show champion named Milrock Polarized Crush. Um, she was, this was in 2019 is the date of her report. The required tests by the Beagle Club are eye check, cardiac evaluation, hip evaluation, that's OFA for hip dysplasia, and a Muesladen-Lukey syndrome, which is a metabolic syndrome that happens in beagles. Additionally, Eddie decided to check for three other tests that do occur in the beagle, although are not as common, and he elected to share these results. So what that means is if you were to buy a crushed puppy, you would be like, you would increase your odds of having a puppy that is healthier with respect to all of these diseases. So I wanna talk about Cavalier King Charles, just cause it's a very popular breed. I happen to love them and what they do in their, in their chip program. And I'm gonna use examples from one of my own client's dogs. I have her permission, plus this stuff is all in the database. So the Cavalier King Charles Club recommends that the dogs be x-rayed for hip dysplasia, either by OFA or pen hip, 
that they have ACVO eye exam, that is now CARE, Canine Animal Eye Registry, um, <clears throat> that's the OFA eye exam, that they have a patellar luxation exam, that is a palpation exam, no x-ray is required, and that the results are sent to OFA, and a heart exam. So that is important if you're a breeder, because you want to know where you're going to. Now, I will also tell you that if you were to call the owner of this dog, and I'm not going to tell you her name, odds are that he would not be available for public stud. But I'm using this as an example. His name is Grand Champion Champion Serenade Royal Wizard at Woodhaven, Black and Tan Cavalier. It's a DNA profile and his siren dam. These are, this is his health testing. And we're going to specifically use the example of health. But I want you to look at how many times he's had his heart checked by a cardiologist. And he has had his eye, he had a, um, his eyes checked at 22, eyes, I'm sorry, heart checked at 22 months, 50, 57, and 69. I, as I'm sure you all are aware, people are very concerned about Cavalier King Charles heart disease. When you have a dog that is still normal at that age, genetically, he's got a really sound background. And as I show you further how to search, you can see how to be, how you can improve your heart outcome on your dog by using a dog like that. So <clears throat> this is a page on the OFA website that I know that you can get this later. But this particular bar right here, testing vertical pedigrees, is like magic in your hands to help you getting dogs that are improved in health. If you're concerned about patellas, which almost every toy breed should be, that's where the kneecap slides out of place, you want to look for dogs in the database that have patella clearances. And then by clicking on the vertical pedigree, not only will you know what that dog's results were, but you will see the parents, the siblings of the parents, the grandparents, and the siblings of the grandparents. So if I were a Cavalier breeder, and I had a Cavalier that I wanted to breed, and I decided I needed to improve my patellas, I could go to that database and compare the patella outcome for a number of dogs and based on their sibling and grand sibling data. Because this is one of those diseases we talked about that is polygenetic. The testing is based on what we see. We don't have the gene test. So you have to rely on what they produce in order to know whether they are <clears throat> likely to be a good producer or not. Let me give you an example from a breeder friend of mine, and I won't say what breed, who had trouble in her pedigrees with hip dysplasia. And she would reliably keep the only puppy in the litter that happened to pass hip testing. Not surprisingly, she made very poor progress toward improving hips because since she kept the only one that, quote, passed, Phenotypically, that dog was normal, but genotypically, it was not. She would need to go outside of her pedigree to find a dog with strong hips on the other side to improve her genetic composition. So you can use chick data to decrease the risk of patellar luxations or slip stifle or other phenotypically transmitted disorders such as hip dysplasia. So I have an example, some examples here for you about what good hip radiographs look at like. The one with the R on the right, these are beautiful, beautiful hips. And what OFA looks at, it's a ball and socket joint. They look at how uniform the ball and socket is, how tight fit, and this angle here, I assume you can see my arrow, is the back side of the socket. The deeper the socket, the better. They also look at positioning. It's critical for doing good hip films 
that these dogs be positioned well and these foramen are the same shape. This particular dog got an OFA exploit. And I should also tell you when the radiologists look at these radiographs, they don't know who the owner is. They don't know what the dog's name is. They know breed, age, and sex. And part of the way they would know sex, even if you didn't see so, this is the female being radiographed. This one's a male. This is a scrotum down here with testicles in it. This dog is dysplastic. And the reason it's dysplastic is, if you look here, we have a nice narrow neck. This neck is all filled in. This is what is called sclerosis, this bright white line. That's sclerosis of the acetabular rim. The back, the socket is shallow, and we have all this space from here to here um, where the hip is not deeply in the socket. So here's a more extreme example. This is another dog who is owned by a friend of mine who got an OFA exploit. And, and this is a, a film that was actually sent in to OFA by a veterinary clinic. And as you can see, this hip is barely in the socket. This looks like a big wad of bone. And that's the dog's body's attempt to make this sloppy joint fit better. I have to tell you with this amount of arthritis, this dog is continually uncomfortable. And that's very sad. When it comes to elbows, a single view is needed and we lay the dog on their side, bend their elbow and shoot from the inside of the elbow to the outside. And uh, most elbow dysplasia is most readily seen along this groove, the, what we call the ulm groove. So this is a normal elbow. This is an abnormal elbow. You can see this kind of hazy arthritis here. You can see all the stress and change here, and you can see change in this particular area in the elbow. I would not want any dog to have elbow dysplasia or hip dysplasia, but I will tell you that clinically, the dogs that I have seen that have elbow dysplasia are more uncomfortable than the dog with bad hips. And that's because dogs bear 60% of their weight in the front. Here is an arthritic lesion, that elbow, the arrows help you see all the changes. And this poor dog is really, really uncomfortable in front. This dog is not going to want to go for hikes in the woods. This dog is going to be lucky to make it around the block. And that completes my slideshow. So let's have some questions, Nicole. I'm ready if you guys are. Thank you, Dr. Smith. That was fantastic. Oh, I actually think with the timing, with the technical difficulty, we might not have time for questions today, but should anyone have any, please email them in. Uh, we'd be happy to respond. Um, and with that, I'll turn it over to Nicole. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Smith. I'm so glad everything was able to work out and we got this presentation off the ground. So thank you to our audience for listening today, joining us, bearing with us through some technical difficulties. And I think everyone can agree that it was well worth it because we all learned so much from your presentation as always. So thank you to everyone again for being here. And of course, if you're not yet a member of our Good Breeder community, we'd absolutely love to have you join us. And you can at gooddog.com slash join and make sure to follow our Facebook page as well. So you can stay up to date on future events just like this because we have one at least every month. And I know we have a lot of exciting things to close out the year with that will all be taking place on our Facebook page. So please continue to join us here and check back every week for the latest and greatest at Good Dog. And until then, I hope everyone has a wonderful week and we'll see you soon. Bye everyone. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Thank you.